The title of my message is Even If You Stand Alone. And the point that I want to get across to us in our in this message is that there are times and circumstances and things in our life that we may have to stand up against on our own. And that could be a situation, a relationship, something at work, something at school, whatever it may be. But it's our responsibility to take care of it and to deal with it. So to better understand this idea, I want to look at Judges 4, 1 through 10, the story about Barak and Deborah. Deborah was a judge during the time that there were judges ruling over the Israelites, and she was given wisdom and understanding that wasn't her own, um, and so able to discern between different situations that the Israelites were going through. And in this particular situation, the Israelites have been attacked by a group of people, and they're like, ah, can you not? And so God said, okay, cool, I'll help you out. So starting in verse 1, it says, After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazar, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagolim. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lepidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day she sent for Barak, son of Ebenoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulon at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak said, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. And then 1 Samuel 17, I'm going to summarize and then go into specific scriptures as we go along, but it's basically the story of David and Goliath. And so all of us are pretty fairly aware of that story, um, is that Goliath was a representative of the Philistine army, David representative of the Israelite army, and they came face to face to figure out who was going to rule over who. That's a really, really Cliff Notes version. Not great. We'll get into it more, more um, directly later. The first point in this topic that I want to touch on is changing we should to I should. Between these two stories, we see a parallel between Barak and David. Barak is told by Deborah that God has commanded him to go and to fight Sisera. The word is so specific to Barak that not only is God calling Barak out, but he's also orchestrating in another way for Sisera to be there for Barak to meet him and for there to be 10,000 additional people to support Barak in this thing that God is calling him to. And this is what Barak says. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. I think in our own lives, we have people that we really trust. And when they're there, we're like, okay, it's going to be fine. You know, like you're planning a party, you're planning an event, you're doing something, you say, oh, who's in charge? Oh, they are? Okay, good. Whew, I'll be there. It's going to be okay. Oh, they're in charge? Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I don't want nothing to do with that. I'm going to walk away. I'm in charge? <laughs> yeah, right. Not today. And we have this attitude sometimes that we see people doing something so often that when it's our turn to step up to the plate and be the one to take action and move forward, we're afraid to do that unless that person is the one that's going to be leading the way. And the problem here with that in our own lives and in Barack's decision to ask for Deborah to come was that by asking Deborah to come, he was trusting more in her presence than in God's promise. 
And so we have to look in our own lives. What kind of things are we capable of doing? Am I capable of doing? And am I dependent on somebody else being there before I'm able to go forth? And is my dependence because I don't trust God and I trust that person more to be able to be successful? Changing we should to I should. Think to yourself honestly how many times you've come into a building, a a party, a situation, you've seen something you don't like, and your first comment is, you know what we should have done? You know what should have happened? You know what we should do? My favorite response to that question is, who is we? Seriously, is we actually you and me? Or is it just somebody somewhere, sometime, someday, And I'm just going to make a comment here, and hopefully somebody will do something. But I said it, so I kind of did my job. If we want to say we should, we have to ask ourselves how much of myself is included in that. And if it's to the point where I can actually do something about it, then maybe it doesn't need to be we should. Maybe it's I should. Maybe there's a reason I notice that need. Maybe there's a reason that there's something that's bothering me. And maybe that's because, for one, when you walk with God, when you walk with the Holy Spirit, you can get that kind of prompting. You can get that kind of recognition and ability to see the things that need to be done for people, for situations, and for really anything, because God gives you that kind of insight through his Holy Spirit. And here's the parallel I'm going to make, and that's to David. Let's go to Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. And David is responding to the Israelites that are afraid to face Goliath. And it says in verse 32, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. I want us to really, really look at that, what David is saying, is you have a whole army of Israelites and one single person that they are afraid to stand up against. And David looks, takes one look at that situation and says, you know what, I can do something about it. I will go fight him. You don't need to worry about it. Sometimes I think to myself, what a relief it is for people who are in a position of leadership that we look up to, that we you know, want to support and help. How a re- what a relief it would be to them to say, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I know that I have skills. I know that I have abilities that God has equipped me with. And I see this need. And I see not only this need, but I see how it will help you and how I can bless you by taking action. I'll go take care of it. And that's very much the epitome of the phrase, see a need, fill a need. I don't think we need permission to help one another I don't think we need permission to say that when I see something wrong, how can I fix it? And that doesn't mean that you go off on some wild tangent doing things behind people's backs and like fixing problems. But what are the steps I can take? What is the thing I'm recognizing that needs to be done? And and who do I need to talk to? What kind of finances do I need? Who usually takes care of this? Maybe they have some pointers for me. There's so much information and knowledge and help around us to be able to accomplish the thing that needs to be done that we don't, you know, we're left with very little excuses. And I want us to take a moment and consider things that aren't even spiritual. Like, like not, even, not even spiritual. You know, how is it that if we are unable to carry the weight of weeds around the church, that we think we can carry the weight of somebody's hurt, of somebody's pain. It's not about the action, it's about the mindset. It's about the attitude that you have towards seeing what needs to be done and what you can do about it. David saw that he was equipped not with his own strength, but with God's strength. And as believers, We have that exact same power, that exact same equipment. So the next question for us 
is what are you equipped with? The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon and lead them up to Mount Tabor. Barak was not alone. Although he wanted Deborah to go with him, he was not alone. He had 10,000 people that were willing and ready and led by God to go with him to win this victory. First and foremost, he had God's command. And second, he had the army. God is with you, and God will bring people into your life to help you with the need that you see that needs to be filled. With David... It says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. You come against me with the sword and the spear and the javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. Looking at Esther's life, her uncle said to her, you know, you were born for such a time as this. And how many of us have seen that in somebody's bio on Instagram? You know, like a very, like I've seen it all the time. I'm like, well, what time? <laughs> okay, and then what? what what's, what's coming out of it? God has prepared you for such a time as this for you to go forth and fight the battle. You have talents. They are good enough. And there is something for you to be able to stand against the enemy or any mountain you face or any kind of thing that needs to be done. Again, not because we are so strong, not because we are so great, but because God has equipped us, because God has taken us from one thing to to the next, to the next, to the next. Situations in your life as a believer, and I believe this 100%, are not coincidental. We don't experience things just because that's how life happens. That's just because that's what happens. That's what we go through. We have our ups and downs. We have a roller coaster. There's always a teachable moment from everything that we experience when we walk with God. And those exact ups and downs and everything is building up for the thing that we need to ultimately face on our own. I'm not trying to like bust up our egos and talk about how important we are, how great we are, how much value we have. I believe that that's all true. But what I really want to emphasize here is that there are some things that only you will experience. There are some things that people will never be able to relate to you in that way. Some things that go on in your personal life that nobody can even imagine is happening when you go home, when you go to school, when you go to work. Why are those things happening? Why is it going like that? You don't have the answer, but you have that experience. And you have that lesson that it may have taught you that somebody else doesn't. And if that's the thing that helps you recognize something that needs to be done and another way that somebody needs to be helped, you need to act on that. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by mistake. Your experiences are unique. And there's something that you can offer that is different and beyond someone else. And that's really the amazing thing about the God that we serve, that he is so much about the individual. If he died for you specifically, then he is working in you specifically for a specific time, for a specific thing. And I think one of the things that I want to point out is that, you know, it's not going to happen like every single day that there's something that you need to do or that you're called to do. There are a lot of people who their testimonies are spanning over years or things that happen in their life that only happen in one instance. When we read scripture, when we read the Bible, and we read the things that happen in the book of Acts, they're written one after another. But actually, there is a significant amount of time that happened between each event, each encounter with the Holy Spirit, each miracle. Things did not just happen one after another. So don't be discouraged that you're not like doing something one thing after another after the other. But take every opportunity as it comes as some way that will prepare you for the next one and the next one when it does come. The last thing that I want to touch on is the title of my message, Even If You Stand Alone. What I really, really want to emphasize here and something that I've had to learn for myself and something that I feel like God has helped me to live and implement is doing it on your own. Is saying that I need to, I need to. This is, this is why I'm here and it could be the most insignificant thing, but if I don't do it, who will? Or if I don't encourage somebody to do it, who will? If I don't start a movement, who will? And it's little things. It's, it's such 
little things that have the greater impact when you're not thinking about the task, you're not thinking about the action, you're thinking about what impact is it making on the lives of the people around me. David, when he goes out to the battle, is confronted by his brother. And his brother says to him, what are you doing around here anyway? What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. Why have you come down here? People will question your motives. Whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? People will question your qualification. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. People will try to have you question your own self. And those are always, almost always the people who aren't doing anything on their own. But they see you moving, they see you taking action, they see you taking a step forward, and they come at you with everything that they possibly can. Why? I have no idea. I couldn't explain it if I tried. I've been told that because I began working in the nursery that that's why I'm single. What? (laughs) Why? Why is that even commentary or an opinion that you need to share with somebody? It's not. And yet, the most ridiculous thing, and I'm out here thinking, man, maybe that's it. (laughs) Maybe that's it. Maybe I spend so much time in that room, I'm not out here when a new guy rolls up. He doesn't see me. He doesn't know. Maybe I shouldn't do it anymore. And it's such a ridiculous train of thought. But But what are you supposed to do when that kind of stuff is coming at you, when that kind of weird comments and opinions and junk is constantly in your head? I've heard so many things about so many different ways that I've been involved and ways that I've wanted to be involved and things that I've wanted to start and do. And at the end of the day, that opposition, that's all it is. It's opposition. It's people who don't understand. I'm not saying that these are bad people, that they're terrible and they're trying to like bring you down and they, they're the worst ever. But the things that people aren't understanding, they'll question. The things that they're afraid of, they'll question and try to bring down. You know, Jesus went through that exact same thing. The Pharisees questioned him left and right. The Pharisees, you know, made others doubt who Jesus was. Our experiences, I feel like I love the scripture that says that Jesus went through the same kind of struggles that we've gone through because they're so specific to a lot of the emotional things that we go through. I really love that Jesus, that we can relate to him on that emotional level, on the things that go on in our heart, more so even than just the physical abuse that he experienced or the, or the physical pain. But that same feeling of separation from God, that same feeling of opposition, that same feeling of people making claims about you that aren't true, saying that what you're doing has no purpose, has no point, and questioning you left and right. Even if you stand alone. Why? Why? Why would we even want to do that? Why would we want to stand up for something on our own? Why would we want to pursue something on our own? There's a lot, a lot, a lot of reasons for this. And a lot of parables that Jesus uses to teach us why this is important. The first, maybe even the most obvious, is the parable of the talents. We have a responsibility. Jesus has given us gifts. We have an ability, big or small. Ten, five, one. It doesn't matter. There's still something that we're accountable for. There's a scripture about the servants whose manager left, and then they come back, and Jesus makes this point that the one who is entrusted with much, much will be expected. And then ultimately, we have the Great Commission. And the Great Commission applies to everybody in every way. Whether it's through standing here on the, on the stage and talking about it, whether it's you know having a friend that you see every now and then, we have a responsibility, and that's not to like scare us and make us feel like we're not doing enough, but that's just a an honest reminder that we won't always have people around us to be the ones to tell us that we need to do this this way so that somebody would be led to Christ. <sighs> That's everything that I have for you guys. 
That's everything that I've had on my heart for a really long time that I felt like I've been learning for myself and that God has been teaching me. And so I want to take the time to pray and specifically to pray for this kind of boldness and this kind of recognition, this attitude of I should, I can, I will. And I say I only as a use of responsibility, not as a use of ego or personal ability. It's just for responsibility. I will do something. If it's as simple as praying to God for an opportunity to do something, if it's as simple as looking for somebody that can help me do something, I will take that responsibility and I will take that first step. If we could all stand and want to lead us in prayer. And then if any of you would like to be prayed for specifically in this way, to be able to see what kind of things you can do, maybe you don't know yet. You know, maybe it's hard to recognize that the thing that you're able to do is exactly what's needed at that moment. Sometimes you can write off the abilities that you have if it's as simple as being friendly and smiling at somebody and not recognizing how much impact that can have in their day. Or it can be as extreme as knowing that, you know, I have a really great prayer life. I know that I pray every night and I know that when I pray I'm speaking with God and God is speaking back to me and I can see how the things I pray for are happening in my life what if I began to pray that way for other people all of those things matter all of those things are taking a stand and standing alone